Welcome to the next episode of General Relativity. I'm your host, Rifat Bari, graduate student in physics at Brown University. Today, we're going to be continuing our discussion of covectors. Now, let's just recap. What are covectors? Remember that covectors satisfy three properties, but the most important property is as follows. The most important property is that a covector can be thought of as a function, a function alpha, which converts vectors v into real numbers. How can you convert a vector into a real number? Well, let me show you an example. Let's say I have a function f of x comma y is equal to 2x plus 3y. Let's look at the contours of this function for different values, for negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. Now, since this, has, this is just a line in 3D, or a plane in 3D, it'll have contours that look like lines in 2D. So these contours might be negative 1, negative 2, 0, 1, and 2. These are the different z values, and when I take cross sections of my plane at different z values, I just get lines, right? Now let's say I have a origin, a origin to this kind of a contour field. And let's define this to be my origin. And let's say, since my field is increasing in this direction from minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1 to 2, this is the direction of increasing ascent. Now if I have a vector v, then I can define an operation, a function alpha, which takes this vector v and just returns how many control lines the vector passes through. In this case, the vector passes through 1, 2 control lines. That means when I apply the covector function alpha to v, I'll simply get 2. And that's the basic idea of covectors. Let me show you another example. Let's say that we have a covector field that runs like this. And let's say this is the origin, and this is the direction of increasing ascent. And let's say I have a vector that goes like this. Well now, since it's going opposite to the direction of increasing ascent, the value of this alpha applied to v is going to be negative 2 because the vector trespasses two control lines, but in the opposite direction to the direction of increasing ascent. Now, what if my vector v lied along one of these directions that the origin passed through? Well, then alpha of v would simply be zero, right? Because the vector doesn't trespass any of the control lines. So that's really all there is to covector fields or covector functions. Now, there's two other properties that covectors satisfy. First, they satisfy the property that if I apply alpha, the covector function alpha, to n times a vector v, n is just a scalar, then I can factor out that scalar and apply the covector to the vector. Simple as that. So this is scalar multiplication. And if I apply the covector alpha to two vectors, then it's the same as applying the covector to each one of the vectors individually and adding it up. So these are the three main properties of covectors. These two properties are known as the linearity properties because that means that the covector v, if I have a covector v and some scalar s, then this covector and this scalar are closed under the two operations of vector addition and scalar multiplication. Now, this is for ordinary vectors. For ordinary vectors, they are closed under scalar multiplication and vector addition, and they form a vector space, right? So a vector space is just the combination of all the linear combinations of vectors with scalars that are closed under addition and multiplication. So just to repeat that, a vector space is just all the linear combinations of vectors and their scalars that are closed under the operations of addition and multiplication. Now similarly, we have a vector space created by covectors. So covectors are also closed, but under a different type of addition and a different kind of multiplication. And we call the vector space formed by covectors a dual vector space, a dual vector space that I'll call V star. Okay, great. So now let's say that this vector space, this dual vector space, if you will, it's closed under a certain kind of addition and a certain kind of multiplication, but what are those kinds of additions and multiplications? Well, they're actually not too bad. So here's the, here's the first type. 
if I apply alpha and n, where n is some scalar to the vector v, then I can simply ignore the n, basically, ignore the scalar, and apply the covector to my vector v, and multiply the result by n. So that's how my covectors are closed under scalar multiplication. What about covector addition? What does that look like? Well, if I have two covector fields, alpha and beta, and I want to apply them to a vector v, that's the same thing as applying each covector field to the vector individually and adding up the sum. So it's the same as alpha applied to v and beta applied to v summed together. So that's all it means for a covector, a dual vector space to be closed under covector addition and covector scalar multiplication. Now, what if you have some vector bases for your covector dual space, for your dual covector space? Now, let's say we have our covector space, V star, and let's say we have a set of bases vectors for the space. I'm going to call the bases vectors E sub 1 and E sub 2. And let's define two covectors, two special covectors, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, that can act on these two bases vectors as follows. So when I apply epsilon 1 to E sub 1, then I'm going to get 1. When I apply epsilon 2 to E sub 1, however, I'm going to get 0. When I apply epsilon 1 to E sub 2, I'm going to get 0. And when I apply epsilon, whoops, when I apply epsilon 2 to E sub 2, then I'm going to get 1. So the moral of the story is that these covector functions act on the basis sets as follows. When I apply epsilon i to E sub j, that returns the Kronecker delta of i slash j, okay? If i and j are equal, then this returns, of course, 1. And if they're not equal, this returns 0, as you can see from above. Now, let's say we have a vector v that can be decomposed in terms of our basis vectors e1 and e2. What happens if I apply the covector epsilon 1 to one of these vectors v? Well, apply, if I apply epsilon to the 1, to the vector v, what do I get? Well, let's expand this out. v, of course, can be written as the component v1 times e sub 1 plus v2 e sub 2. Now, I know from my properties above that we discussed previously that I can distribute this covector function out, factoring out my scalar component v1 and applying epsilon 1. Let's erase this and applying epsilon 1 to e sub 1 plus v2 epsilon 1 to e sub 2. Now hang on a second, what do we have here? We know that epsilon 1 applied to the basis vector e sub 1 is none other than 1. And epsilon 1 applied to the basis vector e2 is simply 0. So it seems that applying this covector epsilon 1 to the vector v simply returns the first component of our vector, v1. And likewise, if I apply epsilon 2 to my vector v, what do I obtain? Well, through a similar process, if I expand out v as v1 e1 and v2 e2 and apply epsilon 2 to just my basis vectors, factoring out those scalar components, then I have epsilon 2 e sub 1 plus v2 epsilon 2 e sub 2. But wait a second, epsilon 2 of e sub 1 is simply 0, and epsilon 2 of e sub 2 is 1. So once again, just, less, just like we did previously, this returns v to the 2. So it seems like applying the covector function to v simply extracts that part of the function. If I apply epsilon 1 to the vector v, I extract v sub 1, v to the 1. If I apply epsilon 2 to my vector, I extract v to the 2. In general then, if I apply epsilon i to v, that picks out the v to the i-th component of my vector v. That's what these covector functions are doing. They're just picking out components of my vector. Now, how can I visualize this? What's really happening here? Well, imagine that this epsilon 1 covector field looks as follows. Let's say it's a set of horizontal lines, okay? So now, when I apply this covector function to my vector, 
then what it's going to give me is it's going to give me how many of these control lines does my vector pass through. Well, that just gives me the y component of my vector. Let's call that v sub 1. And likewise, epsilon sub 2, or epsilon to the 2, let's say that it's a set of vertical lines. And let's say that my vector starts from the origin, once again, and goes here. Well, now, this covector applied to my vector is going to tell me how many of these vertical control lines that my vector passes through. And that's going to give me the horizontal component of my vector, v to the 2. And so that's why when I apply the ith component, the ith covector to my vector v, I simply extract the ith component of my vector. That's all there is to it. Now I'm going to distribute out my covector function and see what I get. Simply factor out my scalar components and apply alpha to the e sub 1 vector and extract out v2 and apply alpha to the e sub 2 basis vector. So now what's going to happen? Well, I have alpha applied to e sub 1 and alpha applied to e sub 2. Hmm, I'm not really sure what to do with those just yet. But here's something. I see v to the 1 and v to the 2 here. But I remember something. I remember that if I apply the e sub i covector to my vector v, then I get the ith component of my vector v. In other words, if I apply e sub 1 to my vector v, I obtain v to the 1. If I apply epsilon to the 2, to my vector v, then I obtain v sub 2. So I might as well rewrite v to the 1 as epsilon to the 1 applied to my vector v, and v to the 2 as epsilon to the 2 applied to my vector v. And let's say I denote alpha applied to e sub 1. Let's say I denote this as some kind of a special variable. I'm going to call this guy here alpha sub 1 and call this here alpha sub 2. So now I can rewrite my entire expression of alpha applied to v as follows. I can write this as epsilon to the 1 applied to v times alpha 1 plus epsilon to the 2 applied to v times alpha 2. And just like in quantum mechanics, we can factor out the derivative operator. Here I'm going to factor out the covector operator. And I'm going to write epsilon to the 1, alpha 1, plus epsilon 2, alpha 2, all apply to the vector v. Okay, all I did was I factored out the operator of the covectors and left out my vector v on the outside. So now I can do something very powerful. See, what I've just done is I've said that alpha applied to v is the same thing as this applied to v. In other words, I can conclude that the covector alpha can be broken down, decomposed as a linear combination of alpha sub 1 of my covector basis e sub 1 plus alpha sub 2 of my covector basis e sub 2. So that means what I've just done is I've, I've broken up any arbitrary covector function as a linear combination of these basis covectors. What does that really mean arbitrarily? That means if I have some general covector field alpha, let's say some kind of a arbitrary covector field like this. Let's say that this is the origin, this is the direction of increasing ascent. Then this field can be broken down as a linear combination of alpha sub 1 of e sub 1. So e sub 1, let's say that those are the horizontal covector field lines, plus alpha sub 2 of the vertical field lines. Don't hold me at gunpoint to the actual direction. Maybe I switched them up. Maybe this is vertical, this is horizontal. But the point stands the same. The idea is that we've broken down an arbitrary covector field alpha into a linear combination of the basis covector fields epsilon to the 1 and epsilon to the 2. So this is the idea. If we want to apply the covector alpha to a given vector, that's the same thing as applying a linear combination of these basis vectors to a given vector. Okay, so what did we just do? We said that if we have, let's say, two non-orthogonal, because in general, basis vectors don't have to be orthogonal, like Cartesian coordinates are orthogonal, but in general, basis vectors will not be orthogonal. Let's say we have two basis vectors that are not orthogonal. How can we get a set of covector bases from these uh, basis vectors? Well, we demand, we make the following demand, that there exists a covector function, epsilon to the i, which when we apply it to our basis vectors, epsilon e to the j, then we obtain 
the chronic or delta. And when we do that, we obtain a set of co-vector bases from these guys. So E sub 2 gives us these horizontal co-vector fields. This is epsilon 2 tilde. And likewise, E sub 1 gives, gives us this set of kind of tilted co-vector fields. This is epsilon 1 tilde. And so from these non-orthogonal basis vectors, we've gotten a set of co-vector bases. And now what we can do, here's the magic, we can express any co-vector function, let's say alpha, as a linear combination of these two. So let's say alpha is some general co-vector field. Okay, here it is. It can be now expressed as a linear combination of, al of alpha sub 1, alpha to the 1, of E sub 1, uh, epsilon sub 1 tilde, where epsilon sub 1 tilde is this covector field, and likewise, plus alpha sub 2 of epsilon 2 tilde, where epsilon 2 tilde is this set of horizontal covector field lines. And so that's what we've really done. In essence, we've been able to break down any covector function alpha into a linear combination of alpha to the 1 of epsilon sub 1 tilde plus alpha to the 2 of epsilon sub 2 tilde. And the reason we were able to do that is because we created covector bases fields by demanding that there exist some covectors epsilon to the i, which when applied to our vectors, our non-orthogonal bases vectors, returns the chronic or delta. So just to recap, we demanded that given these two non-orthogonal basis vectors, there exists some covector function, epsilon to the i. When applied to our vectors, it returns a chronic or delta. That gave us these two covector fields. And now we were able to use these two covector fields as basis covectors for any given covector function. So any covector function alpha can now be expressed as a linear combination of alpha to the 1 of epsilon sub 1 tilde and alpha to the 2 of epsilon sub 2 tilde.